Just a month ahead of the midterms, an unexpected international player reportedly involved itself in U.S. electoral politics. The Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia, Mohammed bin Salman, or MBS. White House officials have called Saudi Arabia's decrease in oil production by 2 million barrels a day a, quote, hostile act that is making the administration reevaluate the Saudi relationship. Joining us now to discuss is friend of the show and investigative reporter at The Intercept, Ken Klippenstein. Welcome, Ken. Hey, good to be with you guys. Yeah, great to see you. Uh, so tell us more about what goes into this decision making and how it'll affect us here. Yeah, so I noticed a rift between um, what the administration and uh, the Democratic Party was saying publicly. And then when I spoke with people, particularly uh, staffers on the Hill, what they were saying privately. So publicly, they're saying that um, Saudi Arabia's oil, oil production cut, which will have the effect of uh, driving up uh, oil and gas prices, um, is undercutting their support for the Ukrainians in the um, Russia-Ukraine conflict. But what I heard privately is that um, they're, they're uh, you know, over over our con concern here is that it's going to hurt them electorally in the election three to four weeks from now. And what's interesting is that the Wall Street Journal reported that, um, and the Saudi government subsequently um, reiterated that um, the Americans had asked them not just to um, not uh, cut the oil production, but to hold it off for a month, which would mean that they would do that right after elections, which also suggests that there's a huge electoral component to that. But that's not something that you see either the administration or these politicians saying publicly. I see. So you're saying that they are basically kind of choosing to foreground the idea that Saudi Arabia is acting in an anti-solidaristic way with Ukraine, a kind of call on Saudi uh, global <laughs> solidarity, patriotism, whatever you want to call it, instead of talking about what might be the more pressing concern, which is how this is going to affect Democrats during midterms? Exactly. And it's all this very soaring rhetoric about you know freedom and democracy against tyranny, when in reality, uh, you talk to these guys and the concerns are uh, a lot more near term and a lot more domestic than that would suggest. So obviously, there is going to spring to a lot of people's minds that there's a certain degree of hypocrisy here at saying that this is the line which Saudi Arabia is crossing, which causes our long-term relationship to be no longer tenable, when, of course, uh, Joe Biden you know, made these proclamations about how he was going to make uh, Saudi Arabia MBS a pariah after the murder, murder of journalist Khashoggi. Um, what, do you think, do, you know, what do you think happened then that caused uh, that promise not to be followed through upon, and why is this a more unique tipping point? Well, if you look at who he staffed the National Security Council with, um, his the Middle East envoy, his name is Brett McGurk, um, it's exactly the kind of DC creature that you wouldn't appoint if you wanted to have any kind of inflection or change in your mm -hmm. policy with regard to the Persian Gulf or Saudi Arabia. McGurk, uh, in this case, has served uh, in the last four administrations going back to uh, President Bush and has, you know, uh, been a reliable advocate for uh, cozy relationships with Saudi Arabia and uh, these Persian Gulf monarchies. So um, from the very start, you could tell that um, this administration was not serious about uh, meaningfully changing its relationship with Saudi Arabia. Now, I think they're paying for it. I mean, I don't think they're wrong to say that they're being treated, um, you know, in a, in a partisan fashion. I think there's plenty of evidence to suggest that MBS is very close and, and, and uh, has a preference for the Trump administration and for the Republican Party to be in office. But um, the Biden administration could have done certain things to uh, mitigate the effect of um, what the Saudis were going to do with regard to oil production. For example, um, reestablishing the JCPOA agreement with the Iranians to put more oil on the market, establishing relations with um, the Venezuelans, which they've you know, suggested that they were interested in doing, but they never really followed through on. Hmm. I mean, one of the reasons, really the reason that it, from a real politic perspective, right, to overlook the human rights abuses, the political abuses, the, the murders <laughs> going on in Saudi Arabia was, from just a realistic standpoint, access to oil. So I, is this kind of the administration saying, like, look, we, we overlooked all this stuff. In the event of a world catastrophe, you would help us out. Now you're, you're not doing that. You're cutting production. So tough luck. Why, like, why wouldn't we, as a result, then just be finally very um, non-compromising in our criticisms of what their government's doing. Yeah, I agree. I think there's a lot of dishonesty in the part of um, think tanks in Washington, which, by the way, are you know just flooded in, in uh, Persian Gulf money from these uh, oil-rich countries. Um, and so w when you talk about you know how we would bring uh, consequences to bear on these relationships, we actually have a lot of leverage because we sell them you know B 
billions in uh, military support and uh, not just the arms and the weapon systems that we sell them, but the support to maintain those. You essentially need engineers to run a lot of these things, which a society like Saudi Arabia in large part does not, you know, have. And so, um, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, uh, in the in the discourse around this, there's a lot of, oh, what can you do? You know, they've got all the oil. we got to do these things. It's kind of like, well, it's sort of complicated. It's definitely a bilateral relationship in that, yes, they provide the oil. But we provide all kinds of technical support to them that they, you know, desperately need. And that I think if um, officials in Washington were honest, uh, gives us a whole lot of agency in terms of this relationship. Yeah, just in August, the State Department approved $3 billion of uh, weapon sales to Saudi Arabia. Has there been any conversation in this context now, this October surprise, about cutting into the, the weapons flow to that country or any other kinds of specific, specific rebuke here? Yeah, so um, Senator Bob Menendez, who's head of the uh, Senate Foreign Relations Committee, put out a statement that kind of sent shockwaves to the um, foreign policy community here in Washington um, earlier this week when he said that he was going to uh, unilaterally cut off arms sales, which he has the authority to do as the uh, Senate chair. And just, you know, speaking to Menendez personally, he's a very establishment guy, not somebody that's going to rock the boat. So for have to have him come out and say something like that, um, you know, I'm pessimistic about the likelihood that that, you know, we're really going to hold the side to account. But that does say something that there's a shift in Washington on the part of the Democratic Party and that, um, you know, what he's saying is really a, a continuation of what progressives in the progressive caucus have been pushing for um, in, in response not to oil production, but to the, uh, you know, horrible human rights crisis in Yemen that is being driven by the Saudi-led coalition there to uh, suspend weapons. So it seems as though there's some wind uh, in their in their sails now for this for this legislation. I mean, that that's just so process. incredible because, like, what is the what is the establishment fighting for? Like, we can we're not even obviously you know being against and being wanting to show opposition to the human rights abuses going on. I mean, that's one thing, but. Even from a just from a okay, setting that aside, you know, being very realistic about what the U.S. government can achieve and trying to get the best results for the people of America and trying to lower energy prices, fuel prices, you know, why should we continue to overlook or help or send weapons to a country that is like not holding up its part of this kind of crooked but very real bargain? It like that's incredible that that would be hard. That would be. That seems like a no-brainer for even the not the not the you know gushy bleeding heart. Um, uh, concerned about human rights abuses, people, but just, even the just kind of the, the establishment as well should concede that this is very stupid. So that's incredible that y you say that you, you expect that, that those, those kinds of weapon sales would continue anyway. Well, what it feels like almost is that, you know, if, if Democrats, if the left that's supposed to be ostensibly the one that's more concerned about the, the crises that are going on in these places are unwilling to actually live by those principles and they give lip service to them in the way that Biden did, but then kowtow ultimately to Saudi Arabia. And moments like this, when you could be taking the case, to your point, to the American people and say, this isn't really our fault. Democrats are the good guys. With The reason that oil prices are, go are going up is because uh, Republicans are willing to get in bed with these people who will murder journalists and do all these horrible things. They don't really have the moral standing to make those kind of pitches because they've already bent the knee earlier on. And I think that the Republicans would rightly point out that they are only kind of posturing being marginally better on those kinds of issues. It's, I mean, it seems like we should bend the knee if it gets us more oil or not bend the knee because it's wrong to bend the knee to very bad people. But we shouldn't bend the knee and also not get more oil. Yeah. Like that's what we're getting, which is dumb. That's exa exactly. We're getting the worst of both worlds. And that's a sentiment that I heard again and again in talking to uh, people in Congress and in the expert community. I mean, he goes to Jeddah and fist bumps the crown prince, which is a huge coup in terms of he's not actually king. And that sends the message that, you know, the U.S., both parties, obviously Trump was close with them, and now the Democrats are willing to acquiesce. Um, and so that really shores up his position within the royal family, which is not, you know, completely certain since he's still not king. And then what does he get in return? He gets a, a $2 million, $2 million uh, oil barrel a day production cut. So what are we getting? This is this is what you know. Being having this uh, position of of ostensible opposition to everything going on in all of these countries, then you have like no alternative. Like we should go to Iran then and be like, okay, let's make an agreement then. Or Screw Venezuela. you, Saudi Arabia, or Venezuela. Well, what Absolutely. is going on with Venezuela? Can, why do you think that they haven't followed through on that? I, I, I know thought that there was some reporting that Chevron and some other, uh, maybe one other firm, are going to be able to do business there again. But what's the situation? They've, ge they've, gest they've gestured towards it, but not with the seriousness 
that would say, I mean, the impression that I get from people in the State Department and close to the administration is that they thought MBS, by meeting with him and by kissing the ring, um, was going to more or less fall in line. And uh, <laughs> so I don't think they th they realized that they were going to have to rely on these other governments. And I was trying very hard in my reporting to suggest that MBS was not going to fall in line, but they didn't want to hear it. They didn't listen. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Hmm. Well, thank you for joining us, Ken. This has been illuminating as always. Thanks, guys. We'll have more rising for you after this.